ETV, The State, The Greenville News, The Island Packet, The Beaufort Gazette, The Sun News of Myrtle Beach, The Herald of Rock Hill, and The Item of Sumter present ETV Debates. Tonight, Democratic candidates for U.S. Senate. And now, your moderator, Dean of USC's College of Mass Communications and Information Studies, Charles Bierbauer. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's primary debate. Among Democratic candidates for the U.S. Senate, this race is to complete the unexpired term for the seat currently held by Senator Tim Scott. Joining me tonight to ask questions of the candidates are Jamie Self from the State Newspaper and Anna Douglas of the Herald of Rock Hill. Candidates joining us this evening are Harold Pavlik of Myrtle Beach and Joyce Dickerson of Columbia. Sidney Moore, also a candidate, had a previous commitment and could not join us this evening. Before we begin tonight, some ground rules. Each candidate will have one minute to respond to the questions, and if necessary, I will allow a 30-second rebuttal. We drew names when the candidates arrived this evening for the order in which we will start. I will ask the first question to Mr. Pavlik. So neither of you candidates is really broadly known across the state. That's not your fault, but you're moving in that direction. So I'd like to get some sense of your experience politically. Uh, let me start with you, Mr. Pavlik. You ran unsuccessfully for Congress in 2012. What did you learn from that campaign that would make you any better qualified to be a senator? Well, I went around to the eight, co eight counties that that was in. Naturally, this is in 46 counties. And I met all the people and I talked to them one on one. And I could see what their problems are, what they want, what they need. Some of them couldn't pay their light bill, wonder where they're going to get that, where they're going to get food, things like that. So in that eight county area, and I think Myrtle Beach is one of them, is, is a little different. But as we get into Marion, Mullins, Bennettsville, I could see the problems that the people have on the ground. And these people would be, a lot of them are on food stamps. As we know, we have 50 million on food stamps. We have 50 million people in right at the poverty line. And most of those people I talked to were on food stamps and they were right at the poverty line. So they're trying to find out what we're gonna do for them. And I say this, unless we get some new leaders that can take charge in Washington, we got a lot of problems. Ms. Dickerson, you uh, serve on the Richland County Council. What have you learned in that role that would make you best qualified to be a U.S. Senator? Well, first of all, thank you so very much for the, for the question, Tom. And also I want to thank the ETTV staff and I also want to thank my colleagues who took the time off this afternoon to watch me. What I've learned is that there are a lot of, you know, similarities between the county the state and the federal. And therefore, with my experience from being on the county for the past nine years, I've served on several, several committees and headed up a lot of committees. And most of the things that I'm most proud of was the fact that we had a failing bus system. And with my, with my colleagues, we were able to work very hard to make sure we secure the bus system. I work for aging corridors, and I think that is so important because aging corridors like Broad River Road, Two Notch Road, those are quarters that really need to be revitalized. So I've learned so much from my colleagues and everyone to make sure that we can improve the quality of life for our constituency. And thank you. Jamie Self has the next question and it will start with Ms. Dis Ms. Dickerson. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, is uh, related to something that's very important in South Carolina right now. Uh, South Carolina's mostly Republican congressional delegation has fought to prevent President Obama's Energy Department from halting construction on a South Carolina plant that would convert nuclear waste to fuel. That project now provides South Carolinians with jobs, but faces a few billion dollars in cost overruns and is running three years behind schedule. If elected, would you stand with Obama's Energy Department if it decides to freeze the project? or would you fight to keep it going and why? Well, I think in South Carolina, thank you so very much for the question. In South Carolina, we are badly in need of, for jobs and I will be doing everything to make sure that the work that we do, everything we can to stimulate the economy and to work with our president to make sure that he understands the residents and the, the, the citizens and the needs of South Carolina. 
I also realize that we have to make sure that we protect our shores and the pristine areas because they are so beautiful. But I will be working and fighting for jobs to come to South Carolina. I want to make sure that our economy is stimulated because that is what we need, jobs here in South Carolina. So yes, I would be working very hard and I would not do anything to halt it, but to make sure that our citizens in this state have access to more jobs so we, our economy can really be stimulated. Mr. Pavelak, can you repeat the question again? Uh, South Carolina's mostly Republican congressional delegation has fought to prevent President Br uh, Obama's Energy Department from halting construction on a South Carolina plant that would convert nuclear waste to fuel. That project now provides South Carolinians with jobs but faces a few billion dollars in cost overruns and is running three years behind schedule. If elected, would you stand with Obama's Energy Department if it decides to freeze the project, or would you fight to keep it going? No, I would definitely fight to keep it going. First of all, one of the big problems is getting rid of nuclear waste, and um, I'm definitely for that. But as she stated, though, it's also uh, given us a lot of jobs, and I'm for jobs. Any way we can get jobs, generally, as long as it's legal, um, I'm for jobs. So. I would definitely uh, be for that plant and whether it has a cost overrun or not. So what? They start, they've been building Highway 83, 73 now. It's only been 22 years and nothing's happened. And I said two years ago, why don't they make it a toll road? No, they won't do that. They just keep right on rolling along, but we have no road. Thank you. Anna Douglas, uh, and the question will start with Mr. Pavlik. Thank you. My question is about gun control. After the Sandy Hook school shooting in 2012, members of Congress passionately debated gun control measures, such as implementing better background checks and better mental health care initiatives. But legislative efforts on gun control failed to get bipartisan support in Congress. What type of reform do you think is needed on America's gun laws and how would you get bipartisan support for that change? Getting bipartisan support, that's like anything else up there. You know, how do you do it? You have all these people lined up over here and the ones over here, and nobody wants to budge. That's why we had our, uh, the shutdown. But the gun problem is big, and the gun people are powerful. I get letters in the mail now every day in the last 30 days asking one, two, question after question after question how I feel about gun control. But frankly, I don't mind people being able to buy a gun and keep a gun in their house, and I have a gun. I don't know how to shoot it, but I have one. But these things that are happening, like at Myrtle Beach this weekend, you know, there's not one suspect. There's five, five, five shootings, five people killed, no suspects, nothing, but there are a lot of guns floating around. And this guy last week, the kid that everyone knew he's sort of mental, and he had it all on the internet and everything, what he was going to do, and he went out and he killed a lot of people. Thank you. Ms. Dickerson? Well, I am certainly in favor of guns. I think, you know, I, I support the Second Amendment, and I just want everyone to know that I think basically what is needed now, since we're experiencing so many problems with mental illness, I think we really need to revisit how we really take care of our mentally ill. I think when we close so many of our facilities, that was detriment to the people of the nation, not just the state, but the nation. So I will be in favor of making sure that uh, families get together with their congressmen, their local local legislators to make sure that we can come together and talk about it and I think the more we engage the families and, and the community I think we'll be able to work out some kind of solution to make sure that we can get some better mental health facilities for the people that we serve it is so important um, and I and I do support that as we are working with the shelter here in Columbia to make sure that we have a safe place for our people to be let me ask you both about veterans issues. There's a lot of concern currently that the VA hospitals are not meeting the needs of veterans. We've got one here in Columbia. Ms. Dickerson, I know your husband is a veteran, but as a senator, what would you do? What would be your priorities with regard to veterans? Well, you know that's my heartbeat. I'm so glad you asked me that question. That is my heartbeat. 
when I look at the condition, the deplorable conditions that we are having with our veterans and our veterans are having to deal with, that is unacceptable. Someone needs to be accountable. I will make sure that whoever is supposed to be accountable will be held accountable. When, when a relative or a, a spouse or a loved one have to lay in a hospital for 21 months before they can get service, that is unacceptable. And I'm gonna say it and I'm gonna say it right here on public television, I said it before, I'm mad as hell about that. And I want you to know that I will be doing everything I can to make sure that our veterans have the quality service and medical care that they deserve. They earn it, they work for it. We should make sure that they have it, them, not only them, but their families as well. So I've said it here on public television, I will fight for my vets every step of the way. Mr. Pavlik, there are a lot of veterans over in the Myrtle Beach area too. What specifically needs to be done? Well, first of all, all the everything on the news, uh, every minute they're talking about firing the head guy of, of the Veteran Administration. I think his name is Oshkosh or something like that because he hasn't really looked after it too much or he hasn't done his job. And I'm definitely, John McCain now said, let's fire him and I'll go along right with him. I would fire him right now. If a man's going in a veteran's hospital and he has to lay there for 12 months and die before anybody looks at him, don't you think it's time to make a change and I'm all for veterans. I'll do anything I can to get more money for veterans. If we have to borrow more money with the budget that we owe $17 trillion on, I will say get the money, let's give it to the veterans. Certain things we have to do, and that is one of them. And if the Republicans start cutting down this thing with the money that goes to veterans, people died in the wars, Iranian, Afghanistan, I'm against it. There's $7 billion there. And there's one woman that's been all over the news the last couple of weeks. Your, your minute's up, sir. Thank you. Anna Douglas has a next question, and it would start with Mr. Pavlin. Last year, Congress passed bipartisan legislation to lower the interest rate for college students who take out federal student loans, and the reform set lower interest rate caps on those loans. Some leaders have said those caps should be even lower, and that students who have already graduated should be allowed to refinance their loans. What do you believe should be done to help college students who have thousands of dollars of student loan debt? If you would lower interest rates, how would you propose funding that program? You know, I'm a good, I'm a good person to ask that question for several reasons. I'm a big believer in education. Now you sent me to Clemson on a scholarship. Then I went to law school, USC, down the street. And then I went to tax school. My father said, why don't you take the extra year? You'll have something on these other lawyers. So I went to tax school in Miami, University of Miami, for a year. But I am a big believer in education. Now, if the people in China that can do pretty good on their, on their grades and on their list, they go to college. They don't have to worry about no money, no loans, nothing. We have to worry about loans. I say if it has to, we have to keep lowering our loans because if we don't get our people to college, we can't keep up with the rest of the world. We're going to be losing ground. We have to get our people to college, whether they're doctors, lawyers, engineers, or whatever. And we have to do whatever is available to get that money. If it takes borrowing more money with the $17 trillion, I'm for that. Anything for education. Ms. Dickerson. Well, thank you. I, I certainly uh, am a, 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 a proponent of education. Uh, both of my children, they are, uh, you know, one of my, my daughter's a college graduate. My son, he attended, he did not complete. But I do, I am in favor of finding ways for, you know, the students when they come out of college to make sure that they can have a lower interest rate and be able to be able to have access to refinancing if that is what they can do, if, that, if that's affordable for them. And I think there are also other programs that give them incentives where those loans can be paid off. Some jobs will take them, you know, will take people on and they will you know, pay off their student loans if they commit to a number of years. So I think there are several ways that students can go to college and, and lower their student loan rates. And I think that is so important to work with probably, a, you know, a large corporation that they start to work with. Maybe they will be able to assist them with those loans. Jamie Self has the next question, starting with Ms. Dickerson. Thank you. Politicians often say that government should be run more like a business. Mr. Pavlak, 
You are an attorney and owner of a real estate business that took a hit in 2010 when you sought bankruptcy protections from creditors. Ms. Dickerson, you are a former beauty salon owner and cosmetologist and a compliance auditor for insurance companies. Question to you both, what is the greatest mistake you've made running your businesses? What did you learn? And why should voters trust you'll do a good job in Washington? Well, you're asking me that question. Sure, I was a cosmetologist for a number of years, a quite successful cosmetologist. The reason I got out of the, out of the cosmetology business was the fact that I realized that I, was, I could go back to college. And I went back to college starting at Midlands Tech where they say from there you can go anywhere. And from there I did. I proceeded to go to Benedict College to complete a BS degree. And that was just a great stop, a stepping stone for me to continue to get out of the hair business and to go into a higher calling in a different business. So I got into the um, accounting and finance um, business. And those that is the reason why. So it was quite successful. I retired there. So I think I did a very good job. And, I'm, and I think that what I do on, from the accounting and finance committee from from Richland County, I will be an excellent choice for someone to have to manage their funds. And I'm very comfortable about that. Thank you. Mr. Pavelik. What was the last part of your question? Excuse me, the last sentence. Uh, what is the greatest mistake you have made running your business? And what have you learned? And why should voters trust you'll do a good job in Washington? Well, I've always tried to run my business right. I've been a lawyer now for 40 years. Um, still a lawyer practicing every day. I've been a realtor for about 30 years and I generally I work in a lot of different areas now. When I had a problem here in 2010 I owned properties in 10 states. I would call myself a commercial property expert. If you want to sit down and talk about any building, this building, the one across the street, the stadium, I'll start telling you what I think it's worth, what it'll cost to duplicate it, that's my business. Now, what happened in 2010, we got hit with a real estate depression. Real estate depression. A lot of banks went out. A lot of people loaned me money went out. But like, I had 120 houses in Atlanta. Some I paid 150000 for. They have not been able to sell those for the taxes. $1,000. Is that a depression? Thank you. Let me, uh, let me ask you about your potential opponent. Uh, if you win the primary, you're likely going to be running against Senator Scott. Now, granted, he was appointed by the governor. He wasn't elected statewide. But by all assessments, he's got a big pot of money to run this campaign. And most of the analysts say he's perfectly safe. Why do you think he's vulnerable? And on what issues would you challenge him? We'll start with Mr. Pavlak on this one. I think he's vulnerable for one reason. You know, if we're going to make it here, with this election, with the Democrats, with the Republicans, we can't get followers there. We have to decide who our leaders are. That's who we have to get here. I haven't heard nothing about him in the news two years. He's been up here. What has he done? What bills has he put in? I don't hear nothing. A guy from Texas, Quazo or something, he's there a first year. All of a sudden, I hear about him in the news every day. We have to get a leader. We can't put a follower there. I consider him a follower, period. He's not going to be a leader. He might be in one if we leave him there for 10 or 15 years. But I'm looking for a leader. We need a leader. We need somebody to, drop, to jump in the mix. And I'll tell you, Mr. Graham has tried to jump in it. I'm not going to criticize anybody, but especially on the federal level, nationally. Now, people in Bennettsville don't know him. They don't know they need food. He hasn't been there and talked to them. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dickerson. Well, I think he's vulnerable, and I am a woman, and that's why I'm in this race. I think South Carolina deserves to have a woman in Congress. Uh, we have not had a woman in Congress since Liz Patterson, and I think it is time for the people and the citizens of South Carolina to look at a strong, a bold, a courageous woman who is not afraid to take on Tim Scott 
And I just say, as I have said all the time, just draw a line in the sand, Mr. Scott, and just bring it on if, if I am the choice for the Democrats when we come out of the 10, 2000, um, June 10th primary. I believe South Carolina is ready for one like me. I, am, I have paid my dues, and I have to say, no, I haven't heard anything from Mr. Scott. He has not called me, and I'm hearing a lot of people say that he does not even return phone calls. So he was el selected. Guess what? Hopefully the people of South Carolina will elect me to be their next senator, and I will challenge Mr. Scott on any given day, at any given moment, on any given grounds. Thank you very much. Jamie Self has the next question, and it will be for Ms. Dickerson. Uh, I'd actually like to use this to redirect a question I already asked uh, to Ms. Dickerson about uh, your business experience. I think it's helpful to voters to see um, how you reflect on uh, experiences that you've had and challenges that you've faced. So I might rephrase it a little bit differently and ask, uh, in your business life or in any of the endeavors that, that you're involved in, um, what major mistake or challenge have you faced? Uh, where maybe you didn't perform as well as you thought you should, uh, and what did you learn from that? Well, I don't really feel I don't I don't believe that I really had a whole lot of, of you know negative. I, everything that I did in my business world, I elected. One of the things, my husband being in the military, we were not grounded in a lot of places. So therefore, I think my longest work uh, was with the Department of the South Carolina, the state of so, uh, South Carolina State and also the Kansas State, because I, that is what I did for the longest. And I didn't have any problems. I was transferred with my husband's job, and so it gave me the opportunity to meet a lot of people, to experience a lot of new challenges. Uh, one of the things I did was to rebuild a whole new IT department. I think that was one of the greatest things I did for a local business here in South Carolina. So I don't have any regrets. I think I am very confident and competent to do the work that the people of this state would elect me to do. Thank you very much. Jamie, did you have a question as well for Mr. Pavlov? Well, I could follow up by asking you a similar question. Um, could you could you talk again about what issue uh, you would challenge Tim Scott on? Where do you think your leadership might be different than the senators? Uh, if I get to Washington, I'm going to do a lot of things that he's not doing. I mean, I don't hear anything that he's doing internationally. I mean, I want to be on this Russian problem, Afghanistan. As you know, our, our president's going to be a lame duck president with two years left. He's going to have no power whatsoever. He hardly has any power now with the Republicans. But Tim Scott, I just don't see anything to argue about him. I don't see nothing up there. I never see him in the news. He's not presenting any bills to speak of. It's just somebody gave him money to put in the bank. Good. And, and Graham has money to put in the bank account. Good. Is that helping the people of South Carolina get food and eat? and things like that. First of all, I'm going up there and I'm going to be working the whole world. I like that. I want to work the world. I'm ready to talk to the people in Asia, Japan, Tokyo, and Putin. I'm following him on a day-to-day -day basis. I read five papers a, news a day because I think you have to, to keep up with what's going on in Russia. Anna Douglas has the next question, and this one will start with Mr. Pavlov. Senator Tim Scott has proposed legislation that would open some of South Carolina's coastline to offshore drilling. Supporters of this plan say that South Carolina and other southern states would benefit from new jobs associated with drilling and that the plan would move the nation closer to energy independence. Opponents have raised concerns about the environmental impact. Do you support offshore drilling and why? I'll tell you, that's a tough question. Um, Naturally, as we looked at what happened down on the coast at St. Pete and all that, when BP had the spill, it took years and years to clean it up. People were hiring lawyers. They still say it's not clean. Um, and that's the problem. That's the risk. If we say we want offshore drilling, then start drilling. Then don't say anything when it breaks and you have oil on all the beaches and none of the people can come. And I know the residents of the beaches are going to love that. So. Frankly, unless I can see some real strong uh, evidence that there will be no spill, I have to be against that one. And secondly, America right now is producing oil. 
In fact, we have people who want us to send gas out. In North Dakota, we got all the oil we need. In fact, our production of oil right now is greater than it's ever been. Now, why gas is $4 a gallon? I have no idea. But right now, we have a lot of oil. Ms. Dickerson? Well, I, I, I am a proponent of making sure that we preserve our, our coastlines. And I, too, would have to say that I would not be in favor of offshore drilling. I, I also think that there are other ways that we can continue to look for job creations. But offshore drilling on our beautiful course, I just don't coast, I do not see it. And right now, I cannot support that. I do think that we should find ways to, to find, to, to do all that. We have a lot of other avenues that we can pursue and people can leave this, can leave to work. But I do not think I would want to do it at the expense of messing up our beautiful coastline, which brings so many tourist dollars here and keeps so many people working. So therefore I would definitely be, you know, not in favor at this time of offshore drilling on our course. Thank you, course, thank you. Candidates, we've got less than a minute. I'm gonna try and squeeze one quick question in here with a very quick answer. Um, immigration is a big issue. How do you feel with regard to amnesty for illegals or a path to citizenship? Can you give me about a 15 second answer, Ms. Dickerson? I think we should look for every way possible to make sure that those, the, the immigrants, that we do some immigration, immigrants reform. So I'm in favor. Mr. Pavlik? I'm in favor of looking at immigration. I think we should definitely take in the people that got here legally, or you could say they're all illegal, and they're in school, they have children, and they're, they're, they're working their lives and they're paying taxes and everything else. I'm for that type of immigration. I'm involved in some of that with some people at Myrtle Beach. We're going to have to leave you at I'm for that kind of immigration. Thank you to both of our candidates for joining us this evening. Thanks to Jamie Self and Anna Douglas. For more information on upcoming ETV debates, check out our website at scetv.org. For everyone at ETV, I'm Charles Beerbauer. Thanks for being with us.